back. Still with me, Scott Greer, Alex Lawson, and Horace Cooper, and let's get back to it. Today marks the 40th anniversary of the Hyde Amendment, which prevents federal insurance programs from covering abortion services. And that means that low-income women who re re rely on Medicaid for health insurance and women in the military who uh, don't get abortion coverage, among other groups. In all, 29 million women of reproductive age right now don't have insurance coverage for abortions. And when women are denied abortions, they're more likely to fi fall into poverty or homelessness as they struggle to provide for the child that they were forced to bring to term. Or they could die, like Rosie Jimenez, who died just months after the Hyde Amendment passed as a result of septic shock after an unsafe and illegal abortion. This is an amendment that Congress has to pass every single year. So isn't it time to let the Hyde Amendment expire and end the cruel practice of discriminating against and punishing women who can't afford private insurance? Well, and isn't Henry Hyde dead? I mean, you know, maybe, maybe the Hyde Amendment, maybe he's not, I don't know. But he, he, he passed. He, I, I thought he, was, he had passed away. Maybe the amendment should pass away, too. I think the one thing we have to realize is that all these women can still get abortion care. They just can't get it through their if insurance. And money. the reason why that we have this compromise, it's a compromise bill. We were talking earlier about how the Republicans are obstructing Congress. Well, the fact that you want this kind of extremism where we have to have one point of view enshrined as law and that they have to be provided, I think this is a worthy compromise that if they, they still, all these women still have the ability to get abortion if they, if they need it or they, if they so desire. The only problem is they can't use uh, taxpayer funds for it. And I think that is a worthy compromise for keeping this but practice alive. But you think taxpayer should be used to, to pay for vasectomies for men? No. If they're <laughs> medically necessary. If they're medically necessary. If they're medically yes. Yeah. It, it's just clear to me that we just can't have two-track health systems on anything. So we need single-payer uh, health care, and abortion should obviously be covered in that single-payer health care system. Um, that is a rational way to provide health care. Um, this compromise, the ability to compromise like this and create two health systems, one for people of means and one for everybody else, uh, one for richer folks and one for poorer folks, it's just not a way that a country like the United States of America should operate. Unfortunately, it is how we're operating. Uh, so I hope letting the Hyde Amendment expire is just the first step in uh, walking towards a rational health care system. Actually. This is a lesson of what the consequences of socializing any area in the government or any industry in the government. What you end up having to do is set a standard that a majority of the legislators will sign off on. Today, what Alex describes could not get a majority. It barely might get a majority of Democrats to support it. There would be a substantial minority of Democrats who simply will not vote to uh, allow taxpayer dollars even under a single payer system to fund abortions. It is far better if people are really concerned about what dictates government makes to privatize areas and broadly in the government so that people are freer to make choices. You mean freer to like die in the dirt like a dog if they don't have the money? Under the present law today, I haven't been reading about the stories of people in the military who are dying like dogs in the dirt because they're not able to have access to a federally funded abortion. This is mythology on your part. Now, I told you what Actually, my view I is. I knew a, a, what girl, my a girl who is, died from an illegal What abortion. my view is, I think we should do to the abortion industry generally what you guys want to do to Walmart. And we should marginalize them. We should push them to the edge of the community. And we should done. find every regulation that we can to put them out of business yeah and so so the only people providing abortions would be in back alleys or in, in in illegal venues and so more women would die okay I get it even though Congress cruelly renews the Hyde Amendment year after year the teen birth rate dropped to a record low in 2015 marking the seventh year in a row of record low birth rates Center for Disease Control reports that several factors have played into that decline but for those who are having sex the CDC reports two major factors in the drop in birth rate more teen pregnancy intervention programs, and increased use of effective birth control like the pill and intrauterine devices. In Colorado in particular, teens and poor women were offered free IUDs starting in 2009, and four years later, the teenage birth rate had dropped by 40%, and the rate of abortions plunged by 42%. So if we really want to prevent abortions and reduce the number of teen mothers and poor single mothers, 
Shouldn't we offer free birth control to teens and poor women who couldn't otherwise afford it? That is the most ridiculous outcome discussion I've ever seen. Now, first of all, the CDC says one of the main drivers of this has been actually less sexual participation generally, which is the smart approach. The second thing is there has been an explosion in STDs, many of them permanently scarring and preventing pregnancy from young ladies, that these um, uh, protections and contraceptions simply do not provide any assistance against. This is terribly destructive. So your and answer bad is advice. just say no to sex. My answer is that we change minds so that people understand that they are very, very valuable how, and how, that they should no not sex. and they should right. not engage okay. in random multi-partner sexual activity. You're going to convince people to not have sex. That's right. what your plan well, is. Said, That's what your plan is. Even though science has shown time okay. and time and time again that you're ideologically anti-science drivel not true. does nothing, nothing except increase the rates of abortion, increase the rates of sexually not transmitted true. diseases. You can do a Donald Trump. You can just say, not true, not true. Or you could go to the or CDC. The CDC you can go to the CDC. Us. The CDC is telling us the numbers are down, it's, and it's not it's greater not number magic. of abortions. It's contraception. And it's not a greater amount of sexual it's activity. to comprehensive sexual education we, that gives people all of the facts. Alex, you cannot get pregnant or get a sexually transmitted disease if you don't have sex. Fact. If you are going to have sex and you use a contraception, you are less likely to get pregnant. Fact. If you use yes, something like a condom, you. it will lower your chances of getting a sexually if you transmitted increase disease. the level of sexual activity, HIV, you increase fact. the risk. Fact. And that's from the CDC. So, and I mean, the Catholic Church has been trying to talk people out of having sex for 2,000 years. years. It's not working all that well. For 50 years, we have seen like, uh, highs and I'm lows I'm in terms of God sexual dis uh, activity and participation. I'm going to have to disagree with Horace on this. You know, I, I actually do think with decreasing sexual activity, that's something that's cultural. That's hard to do with the government. And I think when you look at the Aspen's abstinence-only programs, that's not really what works. I'm not necessarily sure if I'm in favor of free access, but I think there needs to be easier access to contraceptives. And we, when we have sexual education in the schools, we need to teach them not abstinence-only, but how to have safe sex with contraceptives and so that we don't have these kind of problems. That's so. a rational response, I think. Okay, conservatives love to cry that raising the minimum wage will cause rampant unemployment and runaway inflation. But the evidence over the last eight years shows the exact opposite. The federal minimum wage was last raised in 2009, and since then, 28 states, Washington, D.C., and 43 other cities and localities have raised their minimum wages. Since then, we've been on the longest job-creating recovery since the end of World War II, and in 2015, median household income rose by 5.2 percent, the largest single-year increase since record-keeping began in 1967. Raising wages might not have caused those improvements, since correlation doesn't certify causation, but raising wages also did not lead to the runaway inflation and unemployment that the conservatives shriek about. So with all that bad logic out of the way, isn't it time to raise the minimum wage to a living wage so that anyone who works a 40-hour a week can afford to pay their rent and put food on the table? Yes. Thank it's you. It's beyond time for that. Uh, and we've seen the activism and the, the people in the street demanding just that, that uh, this is not a working system where you have billion-dollar corporations like Walmart uh, paying starvation wages and also handing out literature to their um, associates uh, on how to get uh, access to government programs because they pay them so little that they need government assistance to live. Uh, we need to be a country where the minimum wage is a living wage, that money comes back into the economy uh, and everybody benefits. And we are seeing time after time after time in each experiment uh, that this 30-year lock that these conservative, I, don't, I wouldn't even say conservatives, there's been a bipartisan consensus uh, that this was okay, that we could just lock the minimum wage at a starvation level, leave it there forever, and businesses in their wisdom uh, would just do the right thing. It's not true, that doesn't happen, but when we raise wages, uh, we actually see better customer service. We see better business across the board. Wow, we have is evidence this now. Gonna go? uh, you're it's gonna just equal time. No, you've had it for 30 years. This uh, asinine no. concept 
that uh, keeping and, and the minimum the wage at seven dollars is, is somehow the okay. filibuster hides the reality. The reality is the minimum wage, since its inception, has had distorting effects for the lowest earning wagers in the country and in yeah, particular really lifted them out been, of poverty. it has not lifted them out of poverty what we have done is substituted with food stamps housing allotments well, we have spent this the reagan era yes of dollars and this growth that you describe is more a phenomenon of measuring the household after government subsidies have been provided the real reality is this you no more say to an employer that you are required to pay someone not based on what skill that they can offer but on what their need is then when you go to the gas station should you pay for gas based not on how much the gasoline costs but based on what your need is the gasoline would no longer be provided and increasingly what you're seeing this is in not the about inner gasoline. city this wait, is about wait, wages. interrupt alex what we will see increasingly in our app. Your metaphor makes what no sense. Will, Gasoline is heavily subsidized. There's nothing to do. Your whole metaphor makes no sense. Is the distorted, elevated level of unemployment among the black same broken young men argument that's that been used today. for 30 years. What happened with McDonald's? They raised their wages. You know what happened? Happier employer, employees gave better service, had happier customers. Yet, yeah, fortune says that, that's fortune exactly says true. That they have 15% time fewer employees. Time and time employees. again, your point of view is proven wrong, employees. and what you because do is double down because they've automated uh, many and of their that's processes. Where we're going. That's, we that's got nothing to do with the minimum wage. Well, we are going to go. go we are going to go further down the path of automation if these if employers can't afford. We're going to do it no matter what. Yeah, the but you're going to make it quicker if you're making it like $15 an hour. I think it's fine. I think it's fine if local. Uh, local cities and towns want to raise the minimum wage. If they think that it, their economy can sustain it, fine. I think well, Washington, D.C. is one of the few. Boomed as a result of, few, of it. I think Washington, D.C., Seattle, and a few other places are, do have the economies where they're able to sustain it. People here are more willing to pay the higher prices that come with uh, higher, minimum, higher wages. So I think if, if, it, if it works for on a local level, fine, let them do it. But on a federal level, no. I think you're going to have to see. You're going to see this spur. You're going to see businesses going out of business. You're going to see more people going, okay, turning what to automation. Year, Scott? What's, what year? What do you mean, what the year? The minimum wage has been raised over 30 times since you it was introduced it. in I mean, 1935. And there has to be at least one year when the federal minimum wage was raised. And it's, it's been raised as much as 30%. There has to be one year when it's been raised enough that it shocked the economy and destroyed things the way you're well, describing. Absolutely. Way you can do it. Absolutely. You, when it was first introduced. introduced. Was it? When it was first introduced, oh, it, turned, it turned a black employment population of 85% down to 45%. And in, by the way, the advocates of the measure went on to the Senate floor and said that's what they wanted to do. These things have had racially distorting effects and they continue to do so. Marginally equipped. Scott Greer, Alex we'll Lawson, stop. Horace Cooper. Thank you guys.